One of the things we got done was we got a publication out. This is the only paper ever published that interrogates China's monopoly at every stage. It's the only paper ever published that codifies the true measurable subsidies that exist for China. It also lays out all the structural advantages. We intended for this to be a template for our government, for uh, investors, and for uh, people dumb enough to go into rare earth mining to use as a tool. For 20 years, the United States has been completely naked. We have been completely exposed at every single level in the value chain for critical materials uh, that are needed in nuclear reactors, in electric vehicles, and weapons systems. For 15 years that John and I have been working together, uh, we have been pounding on the Pentagon. We've been pounding on the Department of Energy. We've been beating up on three administrations. Uh, and we never really pissed anybody off enough until recently. There are four policy positions that were stated by the four most powerful people in China during uh, when this was published, which I think was 1990. So, Cannon, you see that up there? Yeah, I do, yeah. Uh, combine the military and civil. Combine peace and war. Give priority to military products. Let the civil support the military. Why didn't anybody find this information? Well, this information was published in a 800, 900 page document produced by Congress. It's called the Cox Report. And John and I marched around Washington, DC, showing this to everybody and then showing them how all of these things were integrated into a multi-tiered system of subsidies, hard subsidies, soft subsidies, and structural advantages with the sole purpose of doing all of those things that were outlined above. So what they said to the whole world for us all to hear was to use the economy to strengthen the military. And I don't begrudge them. God, I wish we had a government here that did stuff like this, right? No, they're doing what they need to do for them. What we're doing is we're ignoring it, and they put it in black and white, and we ignore it. So this is a really important document. John's got it posted on the website. I encourage you guys to read it or at least send it to somebody you don't like. I had a conversation with a bunch of people from Rand Corporation who recently told me that this document had worked its way into their planning. So here's Rare Earths. There's 16 commercial elements. What almost no one understands is five of them represent 90% of all value derived from rare earths in the entire planet Earth. And the two that everybody knows best are neodymium and praseodymium. And there's this famous magnet called the neodymium iron boron magnet. And everybody thinks that's the magnet that makes EVs go and it makes wind turbines work and it's what's in your, your, your Westinghouse medical imaging system. The NDFEB magnet is a miracle. It's 35 times stronger than a, a standard ferrous magnet. Miracle, fantastic, what's the problem? If you look down on the lower chart and that little yellow box at about 65 degrees C, the strength of that magnet starts declining. And as temperatures go up, it keeps declining. So if you think about having an electric vehicle uh, that has uh, rare earth magnets powering the drive motor and the brakes, how long do you take by the, but from the time you leave your driveway until that electric motor has a friction temperature above 65C? Even if you had earbuds, you know, earbuds, you can't make quality earbuds because there's, a, a, there's an air friction situation going on because it's still just the speaker. So the NDFEB magnet on its own is really good for toys and novelty items and a curiosity so kids can get hurt in a high school lab. But other than that, it doesn't have any many high value uh, applications. That yellow block is an N magnet and N magnets aren't even rated. Nobody even cares about them in the commercial sense. When you get to the M magnets, the H magnets, and go all the way to the AH magnets, you're continually needing to dope that NDFEB magnet with more uh, terbium, dysprosium, and homium. And it's the only way you can get stability. Well, the problem is the only country in the world that can separate 
terbium, dysprosium, and holmium is China. Consequently, no matter where you mine this stuff on the planet, you're shipping it to them for separation, which means they control it. Which brings us back to their theme. Everything they do economically and commercially is to, to build them up and to strengthen them from a military standpoint. They control your ability to participate in an advanced economy. They literally pick who gets to build electric vehicles. They pick if the military can resupply and build weapon systems. And there's an exception. The exception is the samarium cobalt, right? But the thing about the samarium cobalt is China is the only one in the world that can separate samar samarium. And in fact, samarium prices are so low, even if you figured out how, you wouldn't bother because the cost of separating exceeds its market price. The samarium cobalt magnet, which is the legacy magnet in all U.S. weapon systems, is also 100% dependent on China. So they've got us. They've got us economically, commercially, militarily. And they do all of this uh, through controlling just this tiny, tiny window of technology called separation. The other problem is thorium. And John and I have struggled with this issue uh, uh, with, with Congress, with regulators, you know, for a decade and a half. Typically, and when I say typically, I'm talking about a, a mine or resource that can be developed outside of a third world country. In every case, all heavy rare earths are highly associated with thorium. So what happens is Western mining entities try to avoid thorium, end up mining rare earth deposits that are almost or exclusively light rare earths. They don't even have the terbium or dysprosium to send to China. And so we've been telling policymakers for well over a decade, you're never going to solve this critical material problem until you solve the thorium problem. A side note. How did all this happen? How did the United States, Japan, and France fall from being the world's leaders in, in critical material, resource, separation, metals, and magnets? Well, the NRC and the IAEA changed the regulations slightly, which affected a, a definitional change of threshold for source material. And 100% of our country's heavy rare earth resources were shut down and all of the technology for rare earths were willfully transferred to China. Now, it's been 40 years, and the black magic for separation is so complex that even today, with lots of government money, we have a string of failures for companies claiming to be able to solve the separation issue, uh, and they're getting nowhere closer. Jim, why is it so hard to separate rare earths? Come on, it can't be that hard. You have 15 elements that look exactly the same from the outside. Every single rare earth has seven electrons in its outer shell. And the size difference between the biggest and the smallest is so small that they don't lend themselves to, uh, to separation. How many countries in the world can separate all 16 rare earths? One. How many countries in the world right now can, can enrich uranium to make a weapon? 10, 15, 20? That's the difference. To separate these materials is, is much more difficult than to make weapons grade material from uranium. Okay, so how is it reported in the press? They always tell you we're heading the right direction, we're winning the game. You know, we just gave away some more money to these guys, and those guys have promised the world, and I know they went bankrupt twice, but the third time's a charm. They keep telling us we're on the right track, and things are getting better, and they give you these bar charts that make it look like we're really making progress. But this is what these bar charts really look like. The fact of the matter is, it's just that three-card Monty game. You know, they're not telling you the truth about anything. The resources that we're mining all of the cr super critical rare earths are still passing through China. And without those super critical rare earths, all of those things at the far end where we're claiming our progress 
China still holds 100% control. This is never going to change until we actually accept and deal with the fact that China has built a brilliant monopoly uh, that, that anticipates our actions. And when we apply our predictable actions, it actually strengthens China's monopoly. For example, uh, in 2015, all of the funding that went into new mining resources, rare earths, ended up being a massive debacle because China allowed and in fact helped create a bubble. And when the bubble popped, the Western countries had spent the equivalent of about $6 billion doing exploration, producing uh, detailed reports, 43-101s, a lot of downstream work evaluating and defining resources. And after 2015, there were 400 bankruptcies in rare earth. Well, guess who got to pick through the ashes at everybody else's expense and pick up resources, right? That's what happened. And it's happening again right now. The Western companies started talking a little brash and started talking about moving up the value chain. And as they talked about moving up the value chain and getting into China's sandbox, the Chinese government simply said, we believe rare earth prices are too high. And for 18 months consecutively, prices fell. And right now, according to Benchmark Capital, 97% of the producers of uh, praseodymium and neodymium outside China are losing money. And who are the 3%? Suppliers to China. They basically pulled the rug out from everybody again. There'll be bankruptcies again. We're two-tracking our solution. Caldera is, uh, is, is working with uh, John, TEA, and we're trying to get a, a possession and sale license, and then the other entity would have a, a license to configure downstream products. This is for our project in Missouri. You know, despite the black letter law, which is definitively clear, we should be able to get a permit, the pathway is pretty uncertain. There's, you're certain to spend a lot of money you're not certain to get what you want. Concurrently, we continue to push a piece of legislation. We believe we have sponsors in the House and in the Senate, and we believe that the legislation which would allow for basically what number one is offering, the ability to pull these things out and to manage them and then transfer them and then to upgrade those materials into downstream products. We're working on that legislation. There's a tremendous interest in critical materials. So we believe this bill would have, be able to attach to a larger bill and be part of a, a larger critical materials bill. And a lot of this was possible because this report got a lot of attention. It has literally changed policymakers' understanding of the entire nature of rare earths. The fact is not one of them understood that an NDFEB magnet that didn't have heavy rare earths in it was essentially for toys and novelty items. So it was a great educational opportunity. We were a also able to break out from, from Chinese regulations, the, the exact functionality of, and ratios of their subsidies, and then all of the other things that make competing with a sovereign monopoly impractical or impossible. So what about calling their bluff? What about like when oil prices are low, we fill up our little reserve of oil. We, if prices are low for these rare earth elements, I'm assuming they have a long shelf life. Let's buy a shitload of them so we have a buffer so that we have time to like develop our own and keep the price high. It, it has been historically documented that something like the strategic reserve has never been used once. It's not practical and General Motors is not going to do it. Toyota's not going to do it. No, but no private company's going to jump in there and go, hey, you're selling below cost. Let's buy a bunch of it. The, the truth is these private corporations are saying, hey, they're selling below cost. And until you do, we're not buying from you. All of the onus is pushed upstream. Go get a sales contract with Walmart and wait to get paid 180 days later. What about the federal government doing it as a safety feature for our, for our own national security? The federal government can barely grasp the issues, quite frankly. I'm, I'm just going to say that.
I would say that you can use the SPR as an example that the U.S. is one of the worst commodity traders in history, and I think is even forbidden from uh, doing options on uh, on the commodities. So I agree, it's a good idea. Um, I'm just going to ask kind of each person that presents, how much do you think you need financially to get these projects that you're going up and running, and do you think that this can exist without massive subsidies from the U.S. government? So we have demonstrated that it's impossible to produce a rare earth magnet outside of China because of the subsidy structure. That is a fact. The Department of Energy came to its own conclusion. Uh, in fact, in the real world, every rare earth magnet fabricator of NDFEB magnets operating outside of China loses money on every magnet. And so that's forced every fabricator to move inside of China, which allows China to knock off their IP, to knock off their systems, their you know their 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 processes, and it's particularly been difficult on Japan. Uh, the Japanese are the leaders, the undisputed leaders in uh, magnet fabrication, and when they were forced to move their facilities inside China, China simply knocked off their their equipment, rebuilt it, sold it to Chinese companies cheaper. They they just built a very good mousetrap, and they've anticipated Western responses. And every time we respond the way they expect us to respond, we end up in a worse position. Cool. Uh, since, we're, since we're in Texas, can you comment on the status of MP materials and, and maybe energy fuels? Because I think they're working on this. Uh, MP materials is in the same position it was before, and it will be the next time they, uh, they, um, they bring that thing back to life. Right now, uh, everything they produce, they lose money on. And by the way, everything they produce goes to China. As I told the Pentagon in 2009, Mountain Pass deposit is incompatible with US economic and national security needs. It's, it's a dead end. Energy Fuels has got the right thinking. They've got a permit. Uh, they're very interested in monazites. Uh, but realistically, the entire inventory of available monazites in the United States and continental United States can't be more than 5,000 tons, which means you're going to get 2,500 tons of rare earths, and that's the end of it. I don't see them importing them from Brazil. I see lots and lots and lots of problems there, but monazites are the answer to almost everything. They're on the right path. The entire rare earth industry from mining up to making a compound is a to total loss leader. Yep, we know that, we agree on that, and that's how China built their business, by getting into the downstream and owning the downstream, uh, as well as owning the upstream, of course. But why wouldn't you or any other uh, enterprising person in the rare earth industry just go to Ames Labs or some other lab where there's a million brilliant technologies and do tech transfer and say, okay, we're gonna make this compound used for something else in industry, whatever it is, which is utterly dependent on rare earths and non-substitutable, and we're gonna build that. That would be good for Jim Kennedy, and it's a very small market, but the reality is four or five elements up here at the top, they represent 90% of all rare earth value in the world. When you go to metals and magnets, it's 95% of all value. Think about how crazy it is. I have, a, I have a pile of powder right here, and the piles of powder are 90% of the value. Now I make the world's strongest, most durable magnet for high temperature. The value only increased 5%. What do you think's happening? What's happening is China has such a huge subsidy right there that it owns that forever, and that's where all the value is. That's where the markets are, and that's where our governments our Western aligned governments and industries need help. The highest value of rare earths is magnets and high temperature magnets. So yeah, I can sell a lot of compounds, but and I'll do good, but my country, my allies, our industries, they need access to magnets and they need access to high temperature magnets, so that's the focus. Um, and And so, you know, that's, that's the answer. It, you, you've got to crack that one. Thank you very much. Well, 